Um, so we have our, our panel of questionnaires here, and I'm just going to hand everything off to James Portnow, and he will <laughs> take it from there and take care of this for us. Thank you so much. So I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm just gonna <laughs> let you guys start introducing yourselves. Uh, let's just work from that side down. Okay. All right, hi everyone. I'm Emmy Jonasson. I'm the founder of Indie Game Girl. I think most of you probably saw my talk early this morning. Um, I'm a marketing professional. I market independent video games. So if you have any marketing related questions, uh, feel free to direct them toward me or anyone else too. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Anna Marsh. I'm a game designer. Uh, I've come from a traditional AAA console world, and I'm now uh, running an indie company called, or two indie game companies, one called Lady Shotgun and one called Tickety Boom, um, and currently doing free-to-play uh, mobile titles. Hi, my name's Leanne. I am an indie game developer with this guy. Um, we made a couple of games called Glyph Quest and Super Glyph Quest and a little baby called Willow at the same time. <laughs> um, hi, I, I'm Alex. Um, yeah, what she said. Um, uh, the indie thing is relatively new for me. You know, I come from a, an old AAA background. Actually, it was just A then, and gradually they just keep adding more A's. Um, uh, yeah, but now I'm... I'm blind and wow. <laughs> we're game developers, none of this. F fully indie. So yeah, any questions about that? It's cool. Or anything really. I've got opinions on everything. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is uh, Matthias Deliter, and I'm the CEO business development guy at uh, Da Studios. I'm the guy who just talked, for those of you who can't remember my face or shirt. Uh, ask me anything about game development, basically, and game design. Hey, I'm James Sport now. I'm just here to hang out. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will be just trying to facilitate this, so I'll be calling on you guys as we go. Uh, we, do we have somebody who can run around a microphone? Awesome. Uh, this fellow will be running around a microphone, so as... Do we have a second one? Or, or No, we've, we're using all Wish the microphones. Wish we've stolen. All right. Uh, well, if you can just leave your hands up when he gets the microphone to somebody so he knows who to next run to, that'd be awesome. Uh, and yeah. I've worked on AAA, I've worked on Indie, I've worked on lots of things. If you want to ask me anything, great, but I think you've got many other better panelists to talk to, so uh, use this time wisely. I will let you. Thank you, James. Uh, my name is Frederick. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, locally based TurboType Games. We've been making games in Bergen since 2008. We released games uh, both with the publisher and independently, and uh, if any of you guys are curious about the hurdles and what it takes to start a game studio in Norway and uh, yeah, those things, game design as well, my personal opinions, whatever, go for it. All right, so this is your time to ask us whatever you want. Anything, all right, we got some, let's get that one. Perfect. Thank you. I was, I was hoping we'd have some music. Okay, is this on? Okay, great. Um, so, uh, I have met a lot of game developers here, but as for me, I'm a game researcher. So, I would really like to ask all of you, actually, uh, what kind of topics do you feel like need research, or uh, uh, what do you love the most about game research? What uh, excites you? Something like that, yeah. So uh, either of the side can start. Uh, that side's gonna start because I don't wanna go first, or second. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess well, at the moment we're doing research which is very uh, linked to what Emmy was talking about into our demographic because, you know, I've been a game designer for like 17 years and making games since before that and I've been told for, the, for at least 15 of them that I'm an anomaly, that women don't play games and now we've got the data that proves not only do they play games but they're in the majority and they, they monetize better than the men. So um, what we're doing at the moment is we're doing research into to uh, women, particularly women over 35, the games they play, where they get the information about the games, because so much of the games industry has been based on, uh, oh, it's males 18 to 35 that play games, and that's all we're ever going to market to. So now we need the data to back up um, 
to, to be able to go and speak to investors and say, we know who our market is, we know why they're playing games. So that's the kind of research that I'm interested in. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm basically on board with Anna. Um, I some people think that market research is drab or boring, and I'm obsessed with it. I think that market research is really sexy because I really appreciate. <laughs> I really do. I know people laugh. I really do, but I'm also a nerd, and I like those kinds of things. But I I so appreciate a well crafted marketing campaign, um, and well crafted in the sense that I can tell that whoever put together that campaign really took the time to research who they're speaking to, um, especially if I'm in that demographic, you know, really took the time and they're showing care for their, for their demographic within that campaign. So I think that, and I think now more than ever with all the competition that's going on with indie games, people are starting to realize the importance of that more and more. And that's why, you know, you have indies like Anna talking about the importance of this and the emerging, you know, the new demographics that are becoming realized. <clears throat> kind of going off something you said in your talk, James, I think it'd be nice to see some research in education and games, but um, talking to the academics, talking to the educators, because as games people, we understand the value of games and what we can bring to the table. But I've worked on educational games before, and it was the educators that we had the constant battle against because they didn't see as much value in what we were trying to do as, as what we knew we could bring forward. And unfortunately, I think there's a bit of a, I don't want to say elitism, but it, they they speak in their own little bubble, and I think they need an academic to turn around to them and say, no, 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 yes, there's, there's value in this, and you can really benefit from it. And then maybe they'll help you know, help us and work more with us. So I'd like to see, especially with Willow growing up, if she can learn through gaming, that'd be awesome. So that's why I'd love to see a bit more research in that space. Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, uh, it's obviously it's an important thing. I agree with everything that these guys have just said. Um, and it's nice to have the facts to back up the intuition. But I think things like research metrics, for example, which is probably the the, the, the purest form of presenting that research, you know, which was better, this or that, which, you know, which created more people to click the thing you wanted them to click. Um, I think it's a valuable tool, but it is a tool. It can be used for good, it can be used for evil. Uh, and it shouldn't be used exclusively at the expense of intuition or experience or stuff like that. Um, it's like free-to-play is a tool. It can be used well, it can be used poorly. Metrics is a tool. Sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't. So uh, my only concern with the whole thing is that there are people who maybe don't quite understand game development, don't understand game design, and just rely purely on research that has gone before. And just they then just assume that, and this is how to do it. This is how we do it right. And that means you're probably going to lose you're going to lose innovation and you're only going to end up with the same games that have gone before. And a game can be anything. It, it, anyone can make a game and it can be about anything. It, it can be played in any way. And I think you'll lose a bit of that if all you're doing is relying on research. Research is important, absolutely, but it isn't the be-all and end-all. In the same way that just pure experience, just pure intuition isn't the be-all and end-all. There's a middle ground somewhere where there's, there's a sweet spot in there. Yeah. Uh, well, oops. Uh, hello? Yeah. Hello? Hello? There we go. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, if there's one thing I hate to read, it's violence in video games and how it, if, and how it affects people, where video games, as you all know, uh, what kind of effect video games has on people and how they generally type, uh, tend to blame it on video games and media when violent things happen and big catastrophes happen. Uh, mass shootings and those things you probably know. Uh, I think those things should be more visible, which is maybe not that much, I mean, on the research part, but more on the publishing part. I think that research should be way, way more visible. And we need to really stress that fact that actually violence in video games doesn't affect it that much. It, w it would be nice to get like an official stamp on that, wouldn't it? Definitely. Just to shut them up once and for all. Yep. Like. Uh, so most everything I want to say has already been said. You know that my... Windmill to tilt at is education, and I would love to see more research there. But I actually want to take the flip side of what you said. I would love to see more research into whether or not video games can create empathy, 
right? We're always told that video games engender violence, right? We're, we're all the time yelled at on the TV news for this idea that all we do is run and gun. And yet I know that I've become more sympathetic to certain people, causes. I've come to understand uh, problems which are not my own through games. And so I'd love to see whether or not it, we truly do engender empathy and sympathy and these sort of things through games as well as whatever violent tendencies that uh, we may be able to, as a medium, as all mediums, create. Yeah, uh, going last on a question like that is very hard. Uh, uh, incredibly good points, but uh, but I think maybe I can add something. Um, I, I actually have academic career behind me as well. I was doing a PhD study in uh, games, but it was about the bits and bytes and polygons and all that uh, about uh, optimizing computer graphics. Uh, uh, but for me, uh, what I find interesting now is, 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 is things that uh, James has been talking about in his keynote. It's the, the fun and the motivation. I think that's, that's really, really interesting, and it's something that we do also at TurboType Games. It's our bread and butter to do uh, science simulations, stuff like that. But I'd also, I also have a background from um, uh, making uh, assistive technologies, right, for uh, people with disabilities. And, and I'm thinking, uh, uh, how can computer games be applied to that? I actually, uh, something that I, how I learned computer graphics was actually through making interpreters for blind people what's going on on, on screen, right? Because you, you will never understand graphics better than if you try to circumpass it and, and mediate it to someone who can't actually see it. Um, and, and that's, how, how can that be, how can, how can the motivation factors uh, help disabled people uh, in their ordinary lives? And also, on the other hand, I mean, it's a, it's a question of quality of life, right? Any disability will take away some certain uh, part of quality of life for the person that's suffering from the disability. And, and how can we, can, can computer games be used to bring that quality of life back? Um, I don't know, it's just, yeah. that would be really about, interesting to, to know more about. Is this one still? Yeah. On the subject of um, disabilities, have you come across a charity in the UK called Special Effect? No. They do exactly that. They, they build, um, like we played Angry Birds with our eyes, because they made it so that children who have no, you know, they can't use their arms or they have arms so they can play it with their eyes. But if you, if, you, if anyone is looking at uh, disability in video games, check out Special Effect because what they do is incredible uh, and you, it will literally blow your mind. It's, it's literally, it's a custom rig for any game for any disability. They will, they will take a person who wants to play a game and has a certain disability and they will make something that enables them to do it. It's absolutely phenomenal. But if anyone wants to do research in that space, I'm sure they will be like amazingly appreciative of it. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to have to figure out a way to speed this up a little bit, because I do want to see us get to more than three questions. But yeah, go for it. Uh, I also have a question for all of you, but I'll ask <laughs> you to keep it short, like two sentences max or whatever. Uh, I think there's a lot of students here and people who've never released a game before. So I just want to hear if you have one like specific word of advice or like something to keep in mind that might not be obvious. It doesn't have to be the most important thing, just like one thing, you th one thing you think people would easily overlook in terms of releasing your first game. Fail faster. Uh, feature freeze early and do a vertical slice. Yeah, scope it really small. Like, don't make it big at all. Don't have big ambitions and yeah, just make it super small. Scope it small. Don't be disheartened. Stick with it. It's going to get hard and you're going to think you can't do it, but push through, push through and you'll do it. Just do it. Um, it doesn't matter if you think it's a bit rubbish, just release it, get it out there, get people knowing about you. I'm, I'm actually going to pass because if I was a student right now, I'd, uh, if I could go back and do it all again, I'd go and be an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's really hard and you make hardly no money as an indie, so you know, like, if, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, shut up. <laughs> Um, okay, back on the marketing train. Face your marketing in science and think about the people that you're talking to. I like this two sentence thing. This well, is pretty good. We've caught them out now, and there's no more questions ready. No. Oh, there we go. I, I have a question. Uh, and you can do the two sentence thing if you like. <laughs> so, on the, um, on the subject of uh, education and empathy in games, 
Um, can you tell us if you have ever played a game and you learned a significant lesson about life or some kind of subject? <laughs> yes. I, I've learned that Greenland will not be infected by any viruses anytime soon. <laughs> Seriously, what's with those guys? <laughs> I, I guess I'm just off the top of my head after playing Blow, feeling so bad for the male character at the end that he went, well, spoiler alert, has everyone played this? Blow? Oh no, I'm sorry, Braid. Uh -huh. by, uh -huh. by Jonathan Blow. Braid by Jonathan Blow. Has everyone yeah. played that? Can I talk about the end? Cover your ears. Um, yeah, at the end, feeling so bad for the guy when you realize at the very end that he just was so wrong about everything. Yeah, very tragic. Um, I don't think I've ever learned anything from a game, but I, I bloody enjoy playing them. <laughs> um, I, I think the... Okay, a game that surprised me, and it's a game that I love, was Dark Souls. And, uh, yeah, <sighs> praising the sun. Um, so if you if you haven't played through it and you haven't hunted down every character's storyline and played them through to the end, um, I never knew how sad I could feel playing what is essentially a horror game. Um, the game to the end of each one of those characters' storylines. It's not really a spoiler to say that no one gets out of it okay. And just feeling so so sad from such a brutal game. Uh, go for yeah, it. Yeah. I've already done my bit for the Green and Taurus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're first. Um, I mean, I think I learned the most from video games I didn't think I would learn from initially. Uh, one of those are Walking Dead, uh, the Walking Dead series uh, on moral and ethics. Um, I, I mean, I can't point out exactly what I learned. Like, I learned this and this. But it made me change my thought patterns and views on the world, basically. And, yeah, I think those are one of, like, one of the best games in terms of that. Everything, most of my life I've learned through games. Um, I could go from EverQuest teaching me persistence and teaching me how to approach problems that I didn't think I could possibly tackle to things like Papers, Please. Recently, there's this moment, if any of you guys haven't played it, you should play Papers, Please. But there's this moment where this man walks through and you're just, you're just there, the entire game is about stamping passports, right? And making sure everybody's passport's correct. And this guy comes through, his passport's fine. He says to you, my wife's next, we're political refugees, we're gonna be killed if we, get, if we go back to our country, so we're moving to your country, right? And his wife comes in, and his wife's passport's expired. And you have to make this choice in this moment. The game, the entire game has been about doing, following these rules, right? And stamping this passport and being exact. And the game's actually teaching you about when to break rules, right? It's teaching you through a game entirely about following rules, when it's the right time, when it's the morally correct time to ignore all these rules that society has put in place. And that to me was just this moment where I set down the keyboard and just sat back and thought. And that was a powerful moment to me that caused me to reflect on, on that and learn a lot about myself through, through that moment in games. Yeah, I, equally, I've I've learned so much. I've learned about uh, failing, but equally, I've uh, I've learned about overcoming failure. Uh, I've learned about uh, sacrifice. I played the, the games like Darfur is dying and sacrificed my family. Uh, uh, lastly, in uh, a particular scene in Mass Effect Three, for me, I learned about uh, sacrifice. Uh, I'm not gonna spoil anything. Everyone's probably played it, but I've I've learned more more physical concrete things as well. For instance, I was playing this city builder, which isn't very good, but it's called City Life 2008, something like that. Um, I was trying to, to keep up the power grid for, for my, uh, my city. This is very, a very concrete example. And, um, and I, w I was getting really tired of building new power plants. So I was thinking, I could always sell the excess power. So I was thinking, I'll, uh, to hell with it, you know, I'll just make this huge nuclear power plant outside of town. And I completely ruined uh, the power market. And um, <laughs> my, my town basically went bankrupt because I was producing too much energy and I couldn't sell it to anyone. And then that was kind of a sit back feeling for me as well. Wow, games can kind of, even a, even a not so good game can, can teach me that. And that was something that I was aware of in global economics. But 
but uh, I hadn't really felt it. And I'd been spending 10 hours building this uh, multi-million city and it's just deteriorated into riots and they burned it down. <laughs> and, uh, that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, uh, it, well, it's probably worth saying that. So anyway, my background behind the, this whole thing is my dad's a teacher or he, he used to be a teacher. Um, and he always told me that the best way the best way to get somebody to learn something is for them not to realize that they're learning it. <coughs> and one of the best ways you do that is by playing a game. Uh, because when you're playing a game, all you're focused still on is the rules of the game and how you interact with it and whether or not you're winning or losing or, or progressing through the game. And if at the end of it, you come out and you will have just absorbed the knowledge that you required. And it's amazing how many games have knowledge that you don't think they have. You know, you think it's just relevant to getting through the game, but you, you come out at the end and suddenly, oh, I've learned a new language, or, oh, I, I know about the culture of China, or I know about, you know, whatever. Oh, man, so that, I don't want to take all of our time, but I so want to talk to all of you guys, <laughs> um, because one of the things I often encounter, especially when dealing with teachers, especially when dealing with practicality of uh, what we learn from games, is that transference is the problem is that we have been sort of trained that games in the real world don't overlap, and so people who can do skills, I've, and I've seen it, I've seen mm. kids do high level math for games and then not be able to do it for a test, right? Not know that it's applicable to the real world. So I think that part of our responsibility as developers is also uh, changing that mentality, right? I think it's also key to realize that, by the way, this, is, uh, this applies to games, it's not just video games, it's not just computer stuff, it's all games. If you want to get better at subtraction, learn to play darts. You will be better at subtraction. You want to get better at trigonometry, pool. You know, in any of these physical real world games as well, there, there is some other secondary skill that you can then carry on to other things. I think, and, and the biggest problem is as well with the education system, for example, certainly in England, is your sort of, there's this by rote learning sort of thing. Um, I was terrible at maths at school. Um, you know, trigonometry, finding the length of a hypotenuse. Why, why am I ever going to use this? And they couldn't tell me. If they'd have said, we want to find the range to a target, or, and we want to find the angle at which you're going to have to aim to shoot the guy, I'd be, oh, okay, that's useful. I, I, can, I can use that. Um, but they don't. They don't teach it like that. I tell you what I haven't learned from video games, having picked up Rocksmith. I am brilliant at Guitar Hero and Rock Band. I am rubbish at real guitar. So that's what I haven't learned. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Just in terms of empathy, and this is kind of an unusual um, application for a game, but I think I was speaking to someone earlier about this today. Um, games as they apply to health. And this is one example that I heard a few years ago that really pulls on your heartstrings, but it's such a great application for games that I think we should definitely explore more. Um, there's a company in Boston called First Hand Technologies, and they created this game for burn patients um, who underwent third degree burns and after you undergo that kind of trauma on your body, you have to go through really painful physical therapy where after the skin heals, um, a physical therapist has to physically bend your joints to loosen the skin. And it's excruciating because your skin splits and then it has to reheal. First hand technologies developed this game and you wear a heads up display and you're immersed in this snow-filled world, which is opposing to the heat that you, feel, you felt when you were um, experiencing the burn. Um, and the whole purpose of the game is you're just occupying your mind. You're taking these snowballs and you're throwing them at polar bears and penguins. And they actually had these, these uh, patients undergo MRIs as they were playing the game and receiving the, the treatment. And they found that the pain receptors in the brain experienced a 40% reduction in pain. Um, and I just, I think that's an incredible application for games. And I think that's something where people can look at that and say, wow, games aren't just for kids, you know? So. All right, we should, we should move on, although I'm sure we could all talk about this all day. Uh, but yeah, who's next? Oh, we got it, perfect. I got it, uh, I got a microphone here. I'll try to use it. Um, you've been talking a bit about what we can learn from games. Um, but I'd like to, uh, as an educator, uh, I teach uh, young people game design. And what kind of game education do we need? How, what do we need to learn? What are the most important things 
to learn when you're going to set out and start making games? How can we make game education better? Um, and I know, Matis, you can probably say something. What You're closer. You, you just finished yours. And what was wrong? What was useful with what you uh, learned? What new things do you think sort of were missing? Um, and uh, James, you've been teaching games. Um, Frederick, you've been in this. I, and, and well, all of you really. What, what kind of things were useful? What are people missing out when they come out of these you know, game school? And, and where should we put the focus? How can we teach games and, and making games in the best possible way? Uh, I, I, if you're talking about games courses, there's one absolute thing that um, they're all missing when they come out. They get the bit of paper that says, I've been on this games course, I know how to make a game. What they don't have is a game. Yeah? If, if any of those games courses culminates in and you make and you release a game, that's it. That's the one. That's the one to choose. That's the one to go for. Yeah? If all they're giving you is a bit of paper that says you know how to do it. The, the practicality of the industry is unless those students of yours are going to go on to become their own indie studios, which is a big ask. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing and exciting thing and I can totally recommend it, but it's a big, big ask. Um, then no studio is going to pick them up in anything other than an absolute entry level QA, something like that, unless they've got the drive to go out and make their own game on their own time, they're not going to get hired. And even if you're going to be, do the indie studio thing, right? Like, so I try and teach. Uh, whenever I can, I try and teach in my spare time, I try and teach game development. My course has a 65% failure rate. Uh, you have to make a game a month, every month, soup to nuts. It's for designers. I throw them into an engine that they have never used before. They have to learn the scripting language themselves because every job I've ever done, I've had to learn a different scripting language. And it's in a different genre each time. They have to learn to throw out their ideas. They need to do everything. They need to do the sound. They need to do the programming. They need to do the art. They need to do the design themselves. To understand scope, right? You're not a good artist? Figure out what you can do as a designer. Figure out what you can do with the skills that you have and figure out what your decisions are costing other people when you ask artists to do these things. And then make, make your game school time don't think of it as just school. Think of it as your opportunity to set up your future, right? For my students, I tell them, the goal is to win IGF, right? We have, I have students, all, last year I walked into PAX, right? And a bunch of my ex-students, the sixth floor was almost entirely ex-students of mine who had formed companies from the games that they had built because they had won IGF and as, after you get IGF award, you get a slot on Steam. You, PlayStation will put you up on PSN if you just ask, right? And so as a student, there's actually lots of opportunities to set up your future and think about it in that manner. And then beyond that, I mean, uh, we also have them build a game in an interdisciplinary team because you need to learn communication. So, right, we then have the designers work with artists, work with programmers, work with people of different mindsets to do a year-long game every year along with their other studies. And now the wild thing is, uh, first off, Tools, don't teach tools. Tools will change. Tools are useless. As a, as a developer, you've got to be able to pick up tools. One of the things you need to understand is uh, the game developer skill is to be able to learn quickly, right? That's one of your key assets is your ability to pick up things. And uh, I'm not sure we should be teaching a terribly great amount about games. I think we should be building games and in those courses through the time that we review as educators, we should be working with, but there's so much other life experience, there's so much breadth of knowledge that you need that I think you actually need that more than these, than a lot of the game skills that we tend to teach in these courses. So, sorry, that's my tirade on mm -hmm. games education because it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. I, what, I think there's a said. bit of um, a, an issue in the UK now that there's a huge oversupply. There are people coming out of games courses who there just aren't enough jobs for them in games. And I think there's, when I, I did game design, it was the first course in the UK, and there was eight of us. And we, so we came out and we just walked into jobs, right? Now there's hundreds of people coming out. And I think there's a glamour, oh, I want to do games because it's cool, which it, it is, but there's a lot of, and I think... You know, I, I worry that there's a lot of people who come out of these courses 
who won't get a job just because there's an oversupply now. And that's why, I mean, it angers me. In the U.S., we have all these four-pay schools that will leave you $200,000 in debt and leave you with a piece of paper that means nothing because... Take that 200000 make your own game. Right. And if you're going to go to a game school, I think all game schools, high degree of rigor, right? It's like, you want to be a rock star? Think about how many people get to do that every year out of all the people who want to do it. And that, that's why the courses I teach have such a high failure rate, because I would rather tell you, you're not ready yet, you need to retake this, than say, here's a piece of paper, there's no job waiting for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you pointed out yourself, I'm like recently educated, and I think that if there's two things I would like to see more of, when it came to my, uh, to my education, it's like more doing, as, as, as James said. Uh, a bachelor takes three years. Like, think of that time, you have three years to fail as much as you can. You have a lot of options to fail. I mean, you also have options to fail when you, when you get out there, but when you're in school, you can fail, you can fail terribly, and it doesn't have that much effect on you. You're a student, it's okay. And more doing, like for example, game jams. I would like to see more game jammy things in our education. And I think that would be cool because um, the last year I was at NITH where I have my bachelor, uh, we had this course called game production where it just through one semester, about four months I think, uh, you just made one game all through. Different uh, disciplines, you had leads, and that practical knowledge is what I got the most out of, out of all those three years at school. So more doing, more game jams, and dare to fail, I guess. I think, sorry, I think one of the, um, one of the things that always kind of hamstrings these courses as well is the fact that because the industry historically was always technology-based and the technology in the games industry moves at a, a lightning pace, it really is. What happens one year isn't going to happen the next year, the next thing has come along. Um, and academia in and of itself tends to be quite glacial in its approach. So the stuff that they're teaching tends to be irrelevant after two, three years, and yet the course doesn't change for five years or something like that. So it's very hard to, to keep your finger on the pulse. It's very hard inside the industry to keep your finger on the pulse. Um, and and it, it's very easy to fall off that curve and, and suddenly become irrelevant. I'm sorry, I hate to... But, so I have a master's in entertainment technology. I have a bachelor's in classics. The rigor of thinking that the classics bachelor taught me, I used so much more than anything I learned five years, eight years back in my master's in entertainment technology. So I completely agree. Do you have anything? Uh, you, you basically said it all. Uh, from a Norwegian perspective, from working with game education curriculums, I. I, I, I totally agree, more doing. Uh, I think uh, an Achilles heel of the Norwegian system, as I know it now, is that uh, there isn't enough uh, cross-disciplinary uh, communication. Uh, like uh, someone here said, you know, uh, knowing what kind of toll and strain you put on someone else on your team when you make an executive decision or change the code or, you know, increase the policy or whatever or, or all those things that you could, you could do. Um, so, so doing more as teams and also uh, getting your, your uh, hands dirty, doing the, uh, performing inside the roles that are not necessarily your own so that you get to know and understand. Um, also from a Norwegian perspective, uh, we are definitely uh, lacking uh, the relevance of, of business and the marketing perspective, right? I mean. Uh, like, like James also was saying in his keynote yesterday when he was asked what's w his recommendations for, for the Norwegian developers. We're, we're making great games, making all these great games. They look awesome, they play awesome, all that. But we, have, we don't have any clue how to, how to PR market them, uh, how to get them out there, how to distribute them. And, and also we don't know really how to talk to the people that can help us with it. We don't know how to ask the right questions. Um, it's something we desperately need in, in Norway, at least, you know. Uh, I know schools abroad that are, are, are light years ahead at the moment. We, uh, there's a school in Valenciennes in, in France, it's called Super Info Game. We have interns from there every year at TurboTape Games, and it's an awesome school. I mean, they, they work cross-disciplinary, and they actually have to make this huge game and actually get it out there. But, to, to pass the school, they actually have to release a game, you know, not only make it, but they have to actually have to release it, which is pretty cool. And, uh, and they get jobs all over the world, great jobs. 
So yeah, I think I think in the interests of pulling it back from this really rather depressing hole that we seem to have dived down, what I would say is um, I think the biggest advantage that you've got by being a student on one of these courses is the fact that you have de facto surrounded yourself with like-minded individuals, and that is an incredibly powerful force. When you get two, three, four more people together in the room and they're all going, hey. Wouldn't it be cool if? These are the best conversations to have. And all it takes is one of you to say, wouldn't it be cool if? And then the others start bouncing if, bouncing off, bouncing off. Ah, oh, yeah, and then he could do this with the thing and the stuff, and I want to make it do this. And you get this sort of well of enthusiasm together, which you're not going to find anywhere else. It's very, very hard to make the time and, and actually find yourself in the location where you're surrounded by this sort of people. So the networking opportunities and the friendships that you form in these small teams is something that you should carry with you for the, the rest of your lives. It's fantastic. Uh, that makes me think as well. I was kind of neg negative when I was talking about how, how you, you put the strain and toll on others. Uh, that's the opposite perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, knowing, knowing the strength that you can draw on. You know, I've, I've been amazed as a programmer and game designer. I've been thinking, I've been, I've been dreading going to the art director, uh, asking him to do this thing that I think would be great, but uh, I know the budget, I know the time limits, all that, and I go into his office and I kind of try to push it at him easily, and he's like, oh, that's no problem. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll have that after lunch, and I'll, you know, I'll, 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 uh, uh, I'll triple the stakes and I'll make something much more awesome, you know. So uh, and oh, and, uh, that's a discipline that I don't know, you know. So teach teach people uh, across uh, discipline, and uh, and the games will be all the more better. All right, let's get the next one. Perfect. Not so serious questions, yay! Woo! <laughs> um, this is for Alex and Diane. Um, number one, puns is the best form of humor. No contest. <laughs> That's not a question. Uh, no, but and uh, this, I, I during your talk, I, I had some stuff I wanted to say, but then time ran out. So, um, and number two, I think there was recently um, put down a rule for free-to-play games that if you were to advertise them, they had to be 100% free-to-play to put free-to-play on them, or something like that. And uh, the question is, um, before Unity, did you use any other programs for making games? I didn't. Uh, well, uh, as making games ourselves? No. Or yeah, yeah no, 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 we've no. always used Unity. Um, but in his million years in the industry, um, he's, yeah, a few. Yeah, quite a few. Um, yeah, the, the free-to-play thing is interesting. The, uh, sorry, the, it hasn't come in yet. But it's something they're, they're talking about and they're trying to work out how to do it. The problem, as with all of these things, is if somebody makes a, a major change to the rules, especially if it's in a knee-jerk fashion. I mean, the reason they want to do it is very, very admirable because the concept of free-to-play, it's not free at all. It's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, a lot of this is down to the semantics that we use, i.e. the word free. Um, but... There's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of backlash against it. By just immediately going, and we can fix that by doing this, and not, as we were just talking about as well earlier, the, the idea of, you know, you've got to think this through. You've got to think through the ramifications of what happens. So if they do change it so that only free apps can appear on the free charts, then all that happens is Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, uh, Puzzle and Dragons, all of those things move over into the paid charts and just the top 10 becomes the top 10 that they were over in the free charts. Um, so there needs to be a third option or a fourth option even. You know, options that we don't even know yet might have to appear in the charts. I should point out that this is the, what the European Commission are doing. They have requested that Apple and Google, and just Apple and Google at the moment, do this. Google are the only ones who are actually acting on it at the moment. Apple are probably still in their ivory tower thinking, we don't need to. And I don't know if it's affected over in the States, if there's a similar thing happening. No. No, no not. not at all. Yeah. Um, but it, it, um, as one economist pointed out, it will just mean that the, the pay chart is your top 10. It'd be Candy Crush at the top, followed by Clash of Clans, and they'll just keep changing. And your free chart will be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, because they're the only things that are 100% free, and they're the ones that are mostly downloaded. So it, I don't think it will benefit us, but I think there needs to be 
you know, the third chart or the fourth chart, which... We need more words. We need more words. We need more pages. And I know that they don't want to do this because of the whole, you know, barriers to entry. Like, if you've got four different charts that you have to troll through to find the game that you want, they want to keep it nice and simple, one and two, and that's what you get. I think, I think they could stand to lose the top grossing chart. As a, as a consumer, I've never understood why there's the top grossing chart there. Would you make a quality decision? You know, I, I want to buy this thing based on... Well, loads of people have bought it. Not, well, loads of people have thought it was good. I'd, I, I would make my decision based on a, a qualitative thing rather than, hey, that thing's made a load of money, let's give them some more. Well, I don't understand. So bin off the, the top grossing chart and let's put another chart in there instead. Yeah, well, uh, uh, from a consumer perspective. Yeah, yeah uh, or from a retail perspective. We're, 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 we're devs and we from a perspective, yeah. the top grossing chart is, is seriously interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, not really, because it's still just Clash of Clans. Mm. Yeah, it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> also, Madagascar. <laughs> Those bastards. Yeah, no, they're re yeah. if you don't start in a hot climate, you're never going to get to Madagascar. Just Start in Saudi Arabia. Iceland as well. Egypt's a good one, because it's got yeah. like two... <laughs> <laughs> Hi. This is going to di be difficult, I know. But uh, I don't think you'll be able to do it justice. Maybe you'll prove me wrong. But I'm going to ask anyway, because I think it's interesting. What is your favorite game mechanic? Ooh. Game mechanic? Single game mechanic? Single game mechanic. You can do whatever you want. You can say, like, the shooting, Jump. Game, the shooting in car. Jumping you can is say my whatever. favorite game mechanic. Do you know, what, what I was really impressed about by Clash of Clans is that they made their monetization analog, which is, goes back to the talk about analog, and I was, thought, that's really bloody clever. You've taken, you know, what everybody just thinks is, well, this is how people pay, and you've actually made it into a game mechanic. So w once you've bought your premium currency, um, there's a hundred and... One, well, there's probably, well, I don't know how many different ways, but there's a lot of different ways you can spend that. And I'm one of these people who, if I buy a day travel card to go on the underground in London, I'm really happy if I use that day or travel card a lot. And it's the same thing in Clash of Clans when you've bought your bunch of premium cu currency. If you're very clever with it, you'll get a lot of upgrades out of it. And to me, the fact that they'd taken something that most people had thought of as, oh, well, that's just how people pay, but they'd made a game mechanic out of it was really clever. Oh gosh, I, I, maybe come back to me. You guys go first. That's a really hard question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think um, if if you want to know about my favorite game mechanic, I have to go a really, really long way. Uh, my favorite game mechanic is actually being able to to sit down on the other side of the table of one of these guys and making my move and then anticipating their move and uh, dreading or, or, or being completely awed by their move and, and then in the end beating them, you know? So, so just, just uh, the interactivity of, of, of uh, making a move against another player or the computer and uh, seeing how the outcome unfolds, no matter what game. Can I go really low level with this? It's, it's not a single game mechanic, but it's an, it's an approach to game mechanics, um, and that is risk versus reward. Uh, the idea that you can make an informed decision, so you know what it is that you want to do, you have all the information that you, you require to make that choice, and you make your choice knowing full well that you're putting yourself out there and this terrible thing may happen, but the chances are that this really good thing is going to happen. So distilling it down in, for want of a better term, black and white, uh, look at Ikaruga. You're always making that choice. Do I want to be do I want to be white? Do I want to be black? And there are the, the, the two choices are exactly the same, but it's the environment that changes, and you have to work out, well, I, c I could be white now, shooting the white guys, and I'm perfectly safe. Or I could flip to black, which makes it much harder, but I kill the guys much faster. Um, and it, it's that decision that the player has to make at a sort of a subconscious level. So along those lines, anyway, because you can apply that to a great many different games, like, again, in Dark Souls, do I want to be using my stamina to block? Do I want to be using it to attack? And knowing when to switch strategies, that's, that's what appeals to me. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, as a designer, I'm not sure I can answer this question because like favorite game, I feel like if you have a favorite game mechanic as a designer, you, you haven't played enough games. There's, there's so many different ways to use so many different things, um, but if I had to go with anything, it's really this concept that uh, 
we touched on earlier of game mechanics which are analogs to the real world, right? Game mechanics where uh, all of a sudden you realize what they're saying about your real life or even the game you're playing, right? So that, that is the sort of thing that fascinates me, but I can't give you a favorite game mechanic. I think fascinating is key from a game developer uh, perspective, like you're, you're saying. I mean, uh, fascinating is not necessarily favorite, right? But it's, as a, as a game designer, you just, you just drill and drill and drill and drill into that core. And, uh, and you know, for instance, uh, just uh, being agile or quick enough to capture a pixel on screen and what that becomes as a game mechanic. That could be uh, a shooter, that could be Pong, that could be uh, uh, almost any game that is, that is real time. I was talking about turn-based earlier. But it's like it's it's th those are things that are really 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 deep down in the core of of games, analog, digital, regardless, and that's what fascinates me. At least I don't think I have a favorite either. I I couldn't tell you. I have a favorite game, but that's something else. I think my favorite game mechanic like changes constantly. I mean, I I, I play new games all the time, and I discover new things all the time. I mean, that's what games are about: dis discovering new things. And we are. I mean, and when you are a designer, you discover these new game mechanics all the time. But to keep it short, not quick time events. I think that's a good. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. So I think we're out of time. Um, I wish we could do this for forever. I'm sure all of us will be available. Just feel free. We're all. Most of us don't bite. Um, come up after this. Ask us anything you want. I would love to be able to just talk with you guys about games forever. That's that, that is my favorite thing to do. I have a question. I have a question. Did we nail that last uh, question? Yeah, I was going to say. You were you impressed. You did prove me wrong. Yeah. I'm cool. impressed. <laughs> Thanks. Made my day. <laughs> Thank you all very much.